Hello, everyone. My name is Jason Blackburn. I'm an associate professor of medical geography here in the geography department with Dr. Hammerlink. And I'm going to be guest lecturing on Tuesday, February 26th on sexually transmitted infections in wildlife. And this is just a very short uh, video to walk you through what I'd like you to focus on in the readings so that you can prepare for our discussion next week. We have several papers, and I'm going to quickly outline what I'd like you to focus on in those papers. So all of the papers uh, that I'm sharing with you come from the peer-reviewed literature uh, because we don't have yet uh, sort of clearinghouse information on uh, STIs for wildlife like we do at CDC for human diseases. The first two diseases or uh, papers I'd like you to focus on are by Bosshart and others. Uh, and this group has been looking at dolphin health overall, including sexually transmitted infections, for some time. And notably, they've also been focused on a population right here in Florida in the Indian River Lagoon. So I'd like you to first look at this uh, 2008 paper in aquatic mammals that focuses on orogenital papillomas. And so this is viral transmission, uh, and they focus on um, the single pathogen. It's a virus and it's clearly sexually transmitted. In the second paper in Frontiers, the more recent 2019 paper, I'd like you to focus more in the discussion on the paper about the behaviors of dolphins and how those behaviors might lead to different kinds of infections, including sexually transmitted infections. Because they're highly social and because they're air breathers, they can also manifest respiratory infections uh, and because they feed on free-living uh, uh, animals in the ocean that may also be harboring uh, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, they can also, of course, ingest them. So I want you to focus on behavior in the second paper, but I want you to think about how animal behavior could be driving disease transmission. In the third paper, by Brower and others, we're going to jump to terrestrial animals, and think about dogs for a moment, and I'd like you to think about two things in this paper. This paper is about Brucella canis. This is a bacterial species, and this bacteria is well known to be sexually transmitted in the dog population. We do see spillover of Brucella canis into humans, and our greatest population at risk are veterinarians for handling, or they're often infected from handling, dogs that are infected with Brucella canis. Uh, but in the dog population, it's sexually transmitted. So it's a spillover pathogen that is primarily sexually transmitted in its primary host. The other thing I'd like you to think about in that last paper is the role that human behavior, the dog trade, plays in transmission. Your fourth paper is looking at a wider range of Brucella species than just Brucella canis. So Brucella is a fascinating genus of bacteria, and there are several Brucella species that are pathogenic in humans. And so spillover is a common problem. And in fact, uh, brucellosis is one of the most widespread zoonotic diseases in humans worldwide. This paper focuses on marine mammals of Brazil, and it talks about a number of uh, hosts, different cetacean, whales, dolphins, porpoise species, that can be infected with brucella in Brazil, and talks about the role of behavior there. Um, in the first slide, I showed you the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. Here you're seeing the climbing dolphin, two very different species with two very different social structures. And so I'd like you to think about behavior comparing that Frontiers paper, uh, the second dolphin study uh, by Bossart and others, to this. I then have a paper for you on bird transmission. And what I think is fascinating here is two things. One, this is an experimental study, so they're experimentally trying to measure bacterial changes in the cloaca, the reproductive uh, organ for birds. And it actually looks at what happens when you prevent certain bacterial communities from being transmitted at copulation. Uh, so this is a study that focuses on birds, the kittiwake, uh, the species seen here, which is a type of gull, uh, and 
I want you to think about how uh, bird behavior and then this idea of how bacterial populations change between males and females when copulation occurs. The last one uh, builds very nicely on what you've been working on recently with Dr. Hammerlink on HIV. And this is a study on SIV infection in wild gorillas. And I know with Dr. Hammerlink, you've already talked about the role that SIV spillover into humans and how that led to the HIV epidemic. So probably through uh, bushmeat consumption, we see the virus leap into humans and then establish as sexually transmitted. This is a 2006 Nature paper that looks at SIV infection in wild gorillas by doing surveys and testing for antibodies to HIV-like viruses. Uh, so what I'd like you to focus on here is the how they describe this SIV being endemic in wild gorillas, meaning it can be sustained and transmitted from gorilla to gorilla. A couple of things I'd like you to think about for the readings. First, I want you to note that there's a wide range of animal species here and pathogens across this selection of papers. It's a wild world out there with a lot of diversity and the pathogens associated with sexual transmission in wildlife is is a wide and diverse group of pathogens, bacterial, viral, and fungal. I also want you to note that not all of these pathogens are sexually transmitted, or at least not strictly sexually transmitted. The papers on brucella are the ones to really think about there because we know that a number of brucella species are transmitted to humans when we handle animals or meat or animal products that come from brucella infected animals. So the spillover potential is there, but it also says that sexual transmission is not the only means of transmission. Some of these papers are based on surveys, so boots on the ground or flippers and wetsuits on the ground, uh, trying to measure evidence of disease, uh, and then reporting on whether or not those are likely sexually transmitted or transmitted some other way. And some of these papers, like the bird paper, are experimental. So I want you to keep note of that. The other thing I want you to note, and the reason I'm giving you primary literature, peer-reviewed literature, uh, instead of summaries of these diseases, is that we don't know all that much about STIs in wildlife. Certainly, not the way we understand sexually transmitted infections in humans. And as you've been learning this semester, that in itself is very complicated. It's complicated socially, it's complicated biologically, it's complicated socioeconomically. Uh, in wildlife, we don't know all that much about sexually transmitted infections. And in some of these populations, like gorillas and dolphins, these are difficult populations to study. The other thing I want you to think about, though, is that many of these pathogens that may be sexually transmitted in one population may spill over into humans and lead to the next major pandemic, just like the SIV to HIV leap uh, that you've been learning about. This current coronavirus that you've been keeping up with in Dr. Hammerling's course as well, the now being called the COVID-19 outbreak, that was a spillover event. We don't fully understand that spillover event, but it's uh, most of the evidence suggests it was a spillover event from a wildlife or a, a captive species that was going to be eaten in what's called a wet market spilling over into the human population. So the other thing to keep in mind is that diseases like HIV made the leap and became sexually transmitted. We're starting to see that Ebola might very well also be uh, evolving towards a, a virus that's more easily sexually transmitted than some of the earlier strains of Ebola that were identified. So I want you to think about this idea that we've got sexual transmission going on in these wildlife populations and possibility of spillover into humans. We also have spillover events that might then go on to become sexually transmitted in the human population. So those are some of the things I'd like you to think about. 
and some of the things that I'd like you to have in your mind as you're going through the readings. And I very much look forward to seeing you in class next week.